Um, each term as we start, I have to go through these notes. Most of you all have been here before, but uh, some of you may, may not. At the Lakeside Institute of Theology, all of our courses are free, but and, and you can either take them for personal growth or you can take them for credit. Credit means to get either a certificate or a degree. We offer two levels of certificate, and some people have already qualified for the first level. And this, you know, as we approach the end of the summer, I'm going to be working out how we award those certificates. But the first level, the Certificate of Biblical Studies. In fact, that's on the bottom of your uh, of the reading schedule. You'll notice Certificate of Biblical Studies, and here are the classes that are required: two Old Testament, new, two New Testament, or three New Testament, two of what we call Christian Maturity classes, and this course is a Christian Maturity class. Um, Theology and then Christian leadership. Those are what those abbreviations stand for. And, and there's more detail on that on the website if you want to go to liteachball.org. So Certificate of Biblical Studies, then a Certificate of Biblical Maturity, which is basically biblical studies plus more of the practical applying of this to personal growth and leadership. Then a Master of Theology, which is our version of a Master of Arts in Theology. And then a Master of Theology in Ministry, which requires, 20, I think it's 27 courses. That's our equivalent of a Master of Divinity. Now, the government of Mexico has licensed us to be able to award those degrees. So in Mexico, those are considered valid. We are not approved by any North American accrediting agency. I tell you that. I want to make sure everybody's clear. We've got a few people who really wanted to use this as preparation for ministry. If you took one of these degrees and you know, we can give you a curriculum vitae and letters of endorsement and the whole thing. If you take them to a college or seminary in the States and apply for a job, they'll look at this and say, that's not an accredited degree. I need to warn you that up front. Um, oh, you got one. Okay. Yeah. I think that the content is valid. I mean, some of the people that are taking our courses have taken courses as part of a program of an accredited school in the States. And I think that our, our content is, you know, is, is good. But it is, does not meet the accreditation standards simply because accreditation standards aren't available to us here in Mexico, right? Plus the fact that um, I teach most of the courses, or, you know, probably would create a problem for accrediting, to be quite honest with you about it. So, but classes are free. You are required to purchase the book if you want to do a certificate or a degree, if you're doing this for credit, in other words. If you are in a certificate or degree track, you may miss no more than one class per course. There's seven classes in the course. You can miss one gratis. It's a freebie. But if you miss more than one, you have to make it up. And that means you know, make it up by watching the video and the uh, reviewing the materials and then letting me know. And I'll talk about that in just a second. Uh, if you are in the either cert certificate or degree program, you do have to take the tests, which are at the end of the course. The tests, uh, and you have to do a passing grade. Passing grade is 65 or better. Now, again, if you haven't been in here before, most of you have, I will give you, on the fifth week, a sheet which says what you need to know from practical theology. And it will tell you everything that you need to know for this course. If you know the content on that document, then you will pass the test easily. You know, we very, it's very rare for us not to have somebody pass a test. There have been a few people who the first class they took, they thought, oh, I don't need to study. Well, it is, you know, there is content. There, you, you need to know the stuff. But I will, I will spoon feed it to you. I will tell you what you need to know. Is that not true? It's true. It's true. Okay, I will give you everything you need to know. So it's not, and taking the test is actually a beneficial experience. Uh, you will learn more because of that. But I will give you that if you're taking this for credit, you do need to take the test and pass fail. If you're doing it for personal growth, you can take the test if you want for your own benefit. You don't have to. Um, if you are interested in being a in the degree program, that is a Master of Theology or Master of Theology Ministry, you need to talk to me at some point in the process so that I'm aware of what your goals are, why you're taking it as a degree, and make sure that you're getting everything you need for that. Okay, any questions about that? Not a lot of requirements, only five of them. All right, now, this is, this is the part that's been frustrating. As I say, we have all of the courses. Now, I have a couple of classes that we missed videotaping last term that I, I'm gonna try to make up right away. They're not up yet, but we'll get them up. Other than, I think, three, three classes out of six terms, so 18 courses, 
set either seven or eight classes per course. We've only missed videotaping three, and I need to make those up. But you can make up classes by watching the video, or you can go back and watch videos on any of the programs, that uh, any of the courses we've done. Um, it is free of charge. We have a, a, a couple of places that are using videos from our uh, program for other educational purposes. There's a school, Northwestern University in Washington State, that's using it as part of one of their undergraduate programs. So that's all great. All you have to do to make up a class is watch the video. If you came into our program after some of the courses had already been done and you want to go back and take those, then you are free to do so. Talk to me first. We do ask, as you'll notice here, number one, all makeup classes should be completed before the beginning of the following term, unless you make special arrangements with me. Okay. If there's a reason why you've got a problem with that, let me know. And then, the second part is the one we've had frustration with. All classes made up online must be reported via email to me at rda at rossarnell.net. And I ask, one, that each class be reported in a separate email as soon after watching it as possible. I was getting, and I'm still getting, people sending me an email saying I watched all the videos for XYZ course. And I'm sending them back messages saying, do you remember that I asked you not to do this? The other thing, and, and there's two reasons why I want to get a video at the end of each class. One is it's, it's easier to keep track. It's easier for you to keep track. It's easier for me to keep track. I've had two students say, I've forgotten which ones I watched. Well, you're not going to forget if you send me a message after each one. The other reason is I want, to, I want to be as generous with this process as I can, but I do need to have some sense that people really are watching the videos when they send me this stuff if they're, if they're doing this for credit. That's why sending me one message saying, I watched all the videos for New Testament theology. I get a sense of, really? I feel like I need to ask you to do more than that. And so I want to know after each one. The other thing people have been doing, which doesn't help because it's exactly the same thing in a different, you know, in a different dress, is I'll get eight email messages from somebody within a four minute period saying, I watched this class, this class, this class, this class, this class. How is that any different than sending me one email? If you're going to do this, please, and I'm not trying to be mean about this, but I need to have some sense of accountability too. As soon as you watch each video and review the material, send me a message right then. Don't store them up. <clears throat> okay? Is that fair? Does that make sense? Okay. And what needs to be included is the course title and or code, date, date of the original lecture you missed, the title of the lecture, and just a statement saying, I watched the video, I reviewed all the materials, and completed the required reading. If you go, every one of the videos that we have on the website, litchapala.org, the, uh, the materials, the documents, that is either a PDF or a, or a um, PowerPoint, it's available both formats, whichever one's easier for you, they're right there to review the materials. And so you watch the video, you review the materials, the reading lists, are handed out, but they're also available on each, each of the course websites. And so that's what I need you to tell me, is I watched the video, I reviewed the materials, I did the reading. And then I give you credit for it. I'm, I'm going to take your word for it. Just don't make it hard for me to, to work it out, okay? Um, you do need to talk to me in advance if you're going to take a whole course entirely by video. Like I say, people who come in, came into the program late. All right? Sorry we have to go through that every time. But uh, any questions about any of that? Is that pretty clear? Now again, this PowerPoint is already online. All right, the video's not up yet because we're doing it right now. But the PowerPoint is already online. If you need to go back and review this material, have any questions, it's all right there. Okay, now the reading list, as I told you, um, for this course, I'm not, when I lecture, I don't lecture strictly from the book because you can read. You don't need me to stand up here and tell you what's in the stuff you're supposed to have read. So when I lecture, I lecture from other sources. Ideally, what you're reading in the book and what I'm providing to you are complementary, and between the two, they fill things out and give you more, more of an understanding of what's going on, right? Sometimes my job is to translate stuff in the, that's in the book. That's going to be more so true in philosophical theology tomorrow. But Today, as I said, this 33 Laws of Stewardship, each of them is sort of a, 
a devotional essay on what, what the writer consider a law of how we're supposed to live the Christian life. And so I have it broken up. There's six weeks of reading. You didn't have the book in advance. I got home last night at 8.40 with them. So from San Antonio. So that's why you didn't get in, any in advance. Starting next week, I have broken it up. The six weeks that we're going to meet, I've broken it up into six sections, closest to being an even one-sixth. So page 1 to 26 would involve several, like five of these 33 laws, 33 essays. And the next section, 27 to 52, 53 to 80, etc. So I'm not going to be talking specifically about something that you read this week in the lectures. These are going to be complementary content. I'll deal with a lot of the stuff that's in this book, but not in that order, okay? Um, when you get, if you're going to take the philosophical theology class, you'll notice that I, the page numbers jump around there in terms of what I require for you. It's not straight through like that because different topics are in different places in the book. All right. Um, we are meeting for seven weeks with one uh, week out. The week of September 4th for this class, we're not meeting because Carolyn and I are going to be in Wisconsin celebrating her father's 102nd birthday. Oh, wow. Um, he still lives alone. He's doing great. So, what, as I said to the Bible study last week, um, we figure he's not going to have more than 15 or 20 more years, so we try to get up there to see him every, every year. So that week we are not having class. Give you a chance to catch up on reading or whatever. But otherwise, it will be from now until October 2nd is our last class. Um, you'll notice in some of these classes there are two topics. It's a two-hour class. We will, I'll lecture for an hour, we'll take a 10-minute 10, 10 break or so, and then we'll come back and do the second half. If there's only one topic content, I'll just break it up between the two. But generally speaking, that's how we'll handle those. So we will have a break in the middle. Any questions about that? Does that make sense? Okay, we're good. This is the schedule, which you also have. I always put this up so people know where we've been and you know uh, where we're going with it. Today, we're going to be talking about introduction to practical theology and stewardship. I'm going to get around to what stewardship is in a little bit. Next week, the stewardship of call and vision. Then stewardship of faith and commitment. No class on the fourth. Stewardship of time and opportunities. Stewardship of resources. Resources includes money. And so we're not going to talk about money as a stewardship issue until the sixth week, a fifth week. Then stewardship of influence. How we use our lives to influence others. And then sort of a call to action. How do we wrap all this up and apply it in the final exam? In the last week of each class, the first hour is lecture, the second uh, hour is the final. And I will have for you, on September 18th, is when I will have for you everything you need to know, a document that says everything you need to know from practical theology. Okay? Now this may end up being only the first course of practical theology. And I'm going to talk about what all practical theology involves right now. Any other questions about that? Okay. Let's talk about practical theology. What is practical theology? In the courses some of you have taken already, we've talked about systematic theology, biblical theology, dogmatic theology, etc. Tomorrow we'll talk about philosophical theology. So what is practical theology? Practical theology is the discipline that is concerned with understanding and applying, applying being an important word here, religious practices to our daily life. You'll notice that the root of the word practical and practices is the same. Another way to think about that is that practical theology seeks to find practical answers to the questions in our lives. In other words, how do we apply our beliefs to our lives? Okay, I'm a Christian. I believe in Jesus. I'm wanting to serve him. How do I apply that in practical ways to how I live? Now, there's several different subfields or subcategories to practical theology, some of which you will have heard of. One of them is pastoral theology. Pastoral theology means if you are in ministry of some kind, how do you become a pastor, a shepherd, a caregiver to a body of believers? So pastoral theology, that's obviously very practical. How does a pastor take all of his theological education and care for the needs of people in the midst of that? Another is missions and evangelism. Or what the technical word for that is, missiology, you know, theologies, which means 
the study of, it actually comes from logos, the word, but it, and, and usually it means the study of. So missiology is the study of missions or outreach or evangelism. Very practical. How do you introduce other people to a saving knowledge of Jesus? That's a very practical theology. We also have church growth and church administration. Church growth is, is a, a kind of missions focus which is oriented toward how do you grow your own church? How do you help other churches grow? So it's, a, it's an outreach evangelism kind of thing, but it's very much a science. There's obviously a lot of prayer, there's a lot of, a lot of spiritual content, but there's also a lot of practical content. A lot of it has to do with organizational development. Have you all ever been, you know, studied or been aware of organizational development? You study it in schools, it's part of every MBA program, it's a major issue. How do you organize what it, your business, your church, your you know, rotary club in a way that is going to be most efficient and most effective that will lead to growth and lead to, lead to accomplishing your goals? That's organizational development. Well, apply that to missions and you get church growth. And some of that has to do too with church administration. How do you organize and run your church in a way that will help you practically to grow and to reach out to other people? Spiritual direction. Spiritual direction is, a um, simple version of that is that if you have someone who is a spiritual mentor and that person is both praying for you and counseling you and directing you, it's a very practical kind of relationship. Spiritual direction is, is practiced in the Catholic traditions, Anglican traditions, more so than in the Protestant traditions, all right? But it's, it does exist in Protestantism and it's, a, it's an ancient tradition. You get into theologies of justice, of peace, and of liberation. These are very practical theologies. How do we how do we work for peace as Christians? How do we um, see as an outworking of our faith in Jesus Christ the effort to achieve peace, the effort to to achieve justice for those who are oppressed, or liberation for those who are under oppression? I know theology of liberation has gotten a really bad rap, and it's almost always from people who don't know anything about what it says. Okay. Um, yes, there are some some very liberal, very you know, social, socialistic kinds of, uh, I'm not even necessarily using those words in a negative sense. Um, and so a lot of people have a bad idea about it, but it is a practical application of theology. Um, we also have homiletics, which is preaching. How do you communicate the word? It's a very practical thing. Spiritual formation and discipleship. Okay, spiritual formation means how do we grow? How do we form ourselves? And I'm gonna talk a little bit about spiritual formation and discipleship. It's kind of a transition from practical theology to stewardship, which is a subset. There are others than this. Um, there's a political theology. Politics doesn't just mean Republicans versus Democrats for us Americans. Um, politics is the, is the study and practice of how human organization works. That's what politics really means. Polis means a city, a gathering of people. Politics is the study and application of organized human uh, interaction. So there is a political theology, there is black theology, there is feminist theology, there's leadership development in the context of developing servant leadership. All of those, we're not gonna get into all those, but all of those are examples of practical theology. It's a very wide ranging field. The one that is most important to us in this course, spiritual formation and discipleship is one way to look at this. Um, so we're going to focus, I'm going to talk for a few minutes here about spiritual formation and discipleship, especially I'm going to use the terminology spiritual formation. Are you all familiar with that term? Have you heard it before? I considered calling this class spiritual formation. The reason I didn't is because spiritual formation in, in some like seminary training kind of settings has to do with teaching people how they can help other people in their discipleship and spiritual formation. And that's not really what we're talking about. We're talking about you. Now, hopefully, some of you will take this and you know, spread the word. Some of you will take this and use it in ministry to others because the principles are the same. But our focus is going to be much more how you need to understand the principles of spiritual formation and apply them to your own life as an aspect of practical theology. And so that's what we're going to be talking about in terms of spiritual formation for you. I didn't use the, that term because it's not an academic exercise for training of ministers. We all need to be aware of spiritual formation. Um, so what is spiritual formation more technically? 
It can be defined as, and by the way, all of you all know who've been here before, if you've got a question or a comment, raise your hand. I mean, I, I don't want to, I don't like it when people just sit there. Uh, so talk to me if you've got questions or comments about anything. The spiritual formation can be described or defined as the growth and development of the whole person by an intentional focus on one's first spiritual and interior life, and that could include, does include, the spiritual practices such as prayer, uh, study of scripture, fasting, worship, solitude, confession, simplicity. These are disciplines that the church has practiced for 2,000 years. And they're not just Catholic disciplines. If you guys believe that, then you obviously didn't take our class earlier on spiritual disciplines of the Christian faith. Because these disciplines, um, one of the books that we used in that class, and all of those lectures are available by videotape, we talk about all of the different disciplines, or a lot of them. Uh, one of the texts that we use for that course is Richard Foster's Celebration of Discipline. Now, Foster wrote that book in... 70s? Yeah, mid-70s. And um, I've talked to Richard Foster several times. I've heard him speak a couple of times. I actually did some work for George Fox University in uh, Portland. George Fox is a Quaker institution, and he's Quaker, friends. And um, he, he said, I wrote this book based upon, he said, my real conviction that I felt like God led me to write this book because the spiritual disciplines of the Christian faith have been practiced for 2,000 years. And yet, for some reason, Protestants have completely lost track of them in the last hundred. And he said, I wrote this book, and he said, I can't tell you how many people come up to me and say how wonderful it is that I, Richard Foster, discovered all this stuff. He said, I didn't discover anything. I just blew the dust off the things the church has been doing for 2,000 years. And it has nothing to do with Protestant, Catholic, Orthodox, or Quaker, or anything else. The spiritual disciplines are the means, one means by which we grow our spirituality, become more like Jesus. But then, once we have worked on our own spiritual growth, we then, the next sort of next phase of that, which we're going to talk about more in this class, is how we then apply that spiritual growth that we have developed from our own spiritual practices, how do we apply that in our interactions with other people in ordinary life? If your life is not different in terms of how you live it because of you being a Christian, then you're doing it wrong. All right? We cannot be like the world. We have to live differently. And when we talk about spiritual formation, it means growing your own life, your spiritual life, to such a point that you then are able to see an outworking of that and how you live your life in a way that is visible and active. That you're aware of it, and so is everybody else. That's why it's practical theology that we're talking about, okay? Because it can be seen. It's an outworking. It's a real, a real solid thing people can experience. It's not just an internalizing, although you need to start with that. It is an ex, you know, the practical theology part is when you take the spiritual disciplines, your own spiritual uh, and growth and spiritual formation, and you begin to manifest that outwardly. That's what makes it a practical theology, okay? And it affects your interactions with other people in ordinary life, in everyday life. Watchman Nee, who was a Christian writer who was martyred in Korea, um, Watchman Nee used to say that the goal of every Christian should be to live an ordinary life. But their ordinary life should be a life model of the life of Jesus Christ. What is ordinary for you should be extraordinary for the rest of the world. But for you, it should become ordinary. It should become every day, based upon the model that Jesus gave us in his life. Because spiritual growth means to become more like Jesus, to grow in holiness, to become more Christ-like. That's what spiritual formation is about. If you missed our class on the spiritual disciplines, go back and take it. Okay? George, C., uh, George G. May has said, spiritual formation refers to all attempts, means, instruction and disciplines intended toward deepening of faith and furtherance of spiritual growth. And then in a practical theology sense, that then gets visibly worked out in the world, in your life, in your interaction with other people. Okay? So again, what is spiritual formation? I'm going to quote a couple of quotes from Dallas Willard here. Are you all familiar with Dallas Willard? He passed away just a, a less than a year ago. Um, anything you can read by Dallas Willard 
is more than worth your time. Um, his, uh, Carolyn's sitting back there nodding, and she's a big Dallas Willard fan. His Spirit of the Disciplines, for instance, is a spectacular book. Uh, the Great Omission, you know, he's written four or five books that have won Book of the Year among Christian publishers. He's publishing, you know, evaluation. They had their own kind of, you know, uh, Nobel Prize kind of thing amongst Christians. Um, his stuff is, is not hard to read, but it is deep, it is moving, it is inspiring, it gets you, makes you want to get up and, you know, do something with this. Um, I actually had dinner with him one time and didn't even know who he was. I'd heard his name. I had not read his books then. But we sat next to each other at a dinner in Dallas uh, working with Alpha Group. I was doing consulting with Alpha, which we're going to have an Alpha session sometime in the next next year here. Uh, it's, a, it's a sort of outreach effort to uh, non-Christians. Um, and we were both there, and we sat down next to each other. We spent the evening talking. I was very impressed with him as a person, but I hadn't read his books at that point. So. Anyway, anything you can read by Dallas Willard, you, you should. So, Willard, one, the first quote, spiritual formation is a process that happens to everyone. Terrorists as well as saints are the product of spiritual formation. Their spirits or hearts have been formed. Now, one of the things that I think we need to take from that, and Willard is right, everybody has some kind of spiritual formation. You, you are either being formed to the darkness or you're being formed to the light. We need to recognize that one way or the other, we are being made into something. And we should hope and desire and pray and work for that something to be more like Jesus, rather than more like those who are opposing to Jesus, opposed to Jesus. And that's why this is serious stuff. You are going to become a some kind of spiritual being. And that may change over time. The goal is to make it the right kind of spiritual formation, the right kind of spiritual being. Okay? In Christian spiritual formation, the focus is on Jesus. It is a lifelong process as the believer desires to become a disciple of Christ and to become more like Him. I said that earlier. It's a matter of becoming more like Jesus. That's our goal and our desire. Now, every religion has some kind of spiritual formation. There's spiritual formation in Buddhism and Taoism and everything else. We specifically, obviously, are talking about Christian spiritual formation. And when we talk about spiritual formation, it really goes beyond just, as I said, what's inside. We're talking about the whole person, the ordinary life that Watchman Nee talked about. What he meant by that is we're talking about your mind, your body, your heart, your will, your habits, your functions, how you go through your day, how you interact with people, everything about you. Spiritual formation is having all of that fall under the influence, direction, and control of Jesus so that we are what he wants us to be. To be good stewards of all that we are and all that God has given us. Again, my mind, my body, my habits, my will, my resources, everything else. How am I making that reflect Jesus more? How am I being a good steward of all of those things that have come from God so that I am being more Christ-like and others can see that? Another Dallas Willard quote. quote Spiritual formation for the Christian basically refers to the spirit-driven process of forming the inner world of the human self in such a way that it becomes like the inner being of Christ himself. Willard talks about one of his books that if we really are becoming like Christ, then, when, when, then it's it no longer will really even be possible for us to, to react to things in a worldly way. We really will be new creatures. That when Jesus talks about a new creature, he means as we become more like him, we really do become a completely different being. And we're not talking about just being saved here, we're talking about becoming like Him. And that's only possible by divine grace, it's only possible by the empowering of the Holy Spirit. We can't do that by our own effort. Now we have to be willing to enter into a process, but only the Holy Spirit can, can do that for us. Okay? Now, I've talked about practical theology, the practical outworking of our, our religious beliefs and practices. I've talked about spiritual formation, how we, through spiritual practices, not only change on the inside, but then begin to be visibly changed in terms of how we interact with the world. I want to talk now about stewardship and where that comes into it, because stewardship is going to be the, the nail that I'm going to hang most of this stuff on. It's why your book is called The 33 Laws of Stewardship. What is stewardship? The conducting, supervising, or managing of something is one definition. 
Especially it is the careful and responsible management of some, something entrusted to one's care. In other words, a steward is someone who cares for something that belongs to someone else. That's what stewardship is. This idea that stewardship means giving money, you know, to the church, that's completely the wrong idea of what stewardship is. The question of stewardship is, what am I, how am I going to use all these things that God has entrusted to me? And I'm going to talk about in a minute some of the basic principles, like which you'll find in that little book. The first principle, which they call the law of rightful ownership, is nothing truly belongs to us, everything belongs to God. That's the first of those 33 laws, the law of rightful ownership. And so, very simply, in our lives, if we believe God made everything, God owns everything, the question we have to ask ourselves is, what are we going to do with God's stuff, since he has entrusted it to us? See, God owns it. God owns my house, my money, my will, my abilities, my body, my mind, my relationship with my wife, my responsibilities as pastor of the church, if God owns all of that, my job is to learn to be a good steward of that, to use those things rightly. And that's practical theology. That means how am I actually, what am I actually doing in a practical sense with the stuff God has entrusted to me? It means, you'll notice here, um, the careful and responsible management. The word responsible means we have to be intentional about things. You can't be responsible if you're not aware. We are called on as Christians, with all of the things in our, in our lives, to make decisions, to pursue actions, to, make, to go in one direction rather than another, and we are responsible for how we use those things. I am res Whatever gifts I have, I am responsible to God on how I use those, what kind of steward I am of those things, because God gave me those gifts, and ultimately He still owns them. He owns my money. I, uh, I had one dear brother, you know, bless his heart. <laughs> we always say in the South, you can say anything you want to about somebody if you say bless her heart after that. Yeah. She's getting as big as a soul, but bless her heart. Okay. Well, bless his heart. I had one brother in our church say to me one time, you know, I worked all my life for, for my money. It's my money. I'll be darned if I'm going to give it to somebody else. Bless his heart. It's not his money. It's God's money. And he can say, I worked for it. Well, yeah, who gave you the muscles, the strength, the ability the mind. Who gave you the job? Who gave you the opportunities? You really think you're the one that owns this stuff? That you're the one responsible for this stuff? You're not. None of us are. I can't take credit for anything. I don't deserve anything. And I don't own anything. You know, all of these cliches that they say, you know, you've never seen a, a, a hearse pulling a U-Haul. <laughs> you know, you cannot take it with you. He who dies with the most toys still dies and doesn't get to take them with him. Okay? So we need to have an awareness that we don't own. We only have responsibility for managing. And it's like anything else. If you are manager of a business, you're not the owner, then you have responsibility as a manager for making that business work. Well, your life is a business, and you're the manager of that business. You're not the owner. But you do have responsibilities for making it all work. And that's everything in your life, everything you've been given. Again, mind, body, faith, vision, energy, the people who are in your lives and relationships, your possessions and wealth, your talents and abilities, your opportunities, the influence you have, everything you have a management responsibility. You are a steward of those things because they are given to you by God to take care of for this life. They are not our own. That's the essence of stewardship. It's not about money. It's about everything. There's a, a cartoon that I've referred to. And I've only got a half a dozen jokes. You guys have probably heard these. Um, 
cartoon in the New Yorker years ago, and it was two guys in sort of smoking jackets holding martinis, and they're looking at this big picture window, and outside that picture window are these rolling hills and trees, and you know, and the caption is, one of the guys is saying, well, yes, I suppose God made it, but I own it. <laughs> That's how most people think. They really think that, well, yeah, God created the world, but I own it. It's my money. I work for it. It's my house. Let a big earthquake come along and see how much house you got left. Yeah. Okay. It is all God's stuff. As Christians, we know, or we should know, that all things are made by God and still belong to Him, and that we are called to be stewards of everything that God places or entrusts into our lives. Pam? Can we put on God's fan? <laughs> sure. Jane, would you turn the fan on? Pardon? Could you turn the fan on? I think it's the side. Yeah. There you go. Mike, you want to grab the one in the back? It is warm in here. And I, I claim no responsibility for there being too much hot air. <laughs> so we are stewards. We have been entrusted with all this stuff. You all know this. We came into the world with nothing. We go out with nothing. Anything we possess in between those two bookends of birth and death is God's. We don't possess anything. We are just taking care of it for Him. That's what a steward is. You take care of it until the rightful owner comes back. Right? And the real principle behind that is, since God owns it, people make the mistake of thinking that they're going to find happiness through acquisition, acquiring of things. You don't get joy or blessing or happiness by acquiring you only get joy and happiness and blessing by properly administering or administering. In other words, taking care of, using, applying, making use of. Scripture says God blesses us with material possessions and money and all of the good things in life for two reasons. One, because he wants you to enjoy them. And two, so that you can share them with people who have need. We're all really good with the first one enjoying the things God has entrusted to us, do we do enough of the second, of sharing what we have with those people who have need? Because that's the one that will tell you whether you understand stewardship or not. Whether you understand that it all really belongs to God, and you, you have to answer the question, what does God want me to do with his stuff? He doesn't want you to hoard it. Or, I, and there's a story in the little book there, and there are a dozen stories like this. A story in the book of a man who lived in a house all broken down, you know, had a, had a car, he would go out and collect up garbage and everything else, and everybody thought he was just a squatter, they thought he was poor. When he finally died and they decided to tear down this old rattle trap house, they found the walls stuffed with stock certificates. Millions and millions of dollars worth of stuff. Because he, because of mental illness or who knows why, thought the thing to do was to hoard all that stuff instead of to use it. And he died poor, alone, miserable. Are we that different sometimes? So let's talk about the first principle. And this is the principle of um, the law of rightful ownership, as it talks about in your book, in, in the Southerly, uh, Sutherland and Nowry book. Nothing truly belongs to us. And I'm going to give you some scripture verses here. Just, just so you know, I don't, I don't make this stuff up. One, 1 Chronicles 29, 11, Yours, Lord, this is uh, David speaking, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor for everything in heaven and earth is yours. Everything. It's all his. You notice, it's not just that he made it. It is still his. Psalm 24, 1 and 2. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it, as he founded it on the for he founded it on the seas and established it on the waters. Exodus 19, 5 and 6. Although the whole world is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. That's God speaking. The whole world is mine. He's speaking to the Israelites there in Exodus. From Psalm 50, I have no need of a bull from your stall or of goats from your pens. For every animal of the forest is mine, and the cattle on a thousand hills. God doesn't need our sacrifices. And so many people 
have this idea, especially preachers, when we you know <laughs> ask people to give. It, it's like it's like we get this impression that God is sitting on His throne in the heavenly kingdom, wringing His hands, saying, like, "I sure hope those people that." Little chapel or Lakeside Presbyterian Church put money in the, in the basket this week because if they don't, then my will is not going to be done on earth. God does not need our money. He already owns it all. And that's one of the things we're going to get to, into in stewardship. One of the things that God does is He allows us to be blessed by utilizing the resources He provides, by participating. When somebody gives to the things of God, God is giving them an opportunity to be blessed by that, to participate with Him. It's just like prayer. The mystery of why, if God knows everything and can do everything, does He need us to pray? Because God desires to allow us, for our blessing and benefit, to participate with Him in the working out of His will in the world. The same thing is true when we give. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He doesn't need our money. He wants us to give for our sakes. I... Carolyn and I, again, again, talking about stewardship, and you always fall into money because that's the easy one. Carolyn, when I taught at University Presbyterian Church in Seattle for 18 years, and any time if I was teaching a Bible study or anything else, and we got to a section about Christians' responsibility with money, Carolyn and I would wait for the yes but. Because we'd be talking about the need to give, and somebody invariably we just waited for it I mean, is this not true Carolyn yes. we, we talk about we I would say okay we're gonna get a yes but this week they go well yes but all those people if they just go get a job then they wouldn't need us to get to them I had one guy one time say well yeah back in biblical times uh, the people had to give charitable tithing and everything because uh, there was no government to take care of people that the temple had to do it but I pay taxes and that takes care of people's needs so I don't have to give charitable giving and I looked at him and said, do you really think that God needs your money to take care of the poor? God needs your money because you need to give him your money. It's for you, not for God, not for the poor. But we would always get these yes, but, because people had this wacky idea. Well, money is the obvious one. But the same thing is true with how we use our homes, our relationships, our abilities, anything else that we have. And the Lord owns the cattle on a thousand hills, there's a song. The Lord owns the cattle on a thousand hills. You may know it. You may have heard it. When I was in high school, I was a junior counselor at a Bible camp. And we had, there were five Debbies who were also junior counselors. <laughs> Debbie was a popular name in, in, in the 1970s. Um, we called them, it was Debbie Philippi, Debbie, anyway, Flippy, Willie, something car. You know, and one of them we actually called Debbie. And one of them, like the last week of summer camp, she was, in the evening, she was sitting on the steps. She was a sweetheart. Debbie, Debbie Funk was her name. And I walked up to her, and she was singing real quietly. And I sat down and said, what you doing, Dad? And she said, oh, I'm just sitting here singing The Lord Owns a Cattle on a Thousand Hills. And I said, oh, really? She said, yeah. She said, I've been accepted to Moody Bible Institute. She graduated from high school the previous uh, spring. I've been accepted to Moody Bible Institute, and I don't have any money. And I'm supposed to go next week. And I have no idea how to... For it. I was just sitting here thinking and singing, the Lord owns a cattle on a thousand hills, and thinking, Lord, it would be nice if you could sell some cows. <laughs> the next day, and I am not kidding you, the next day she got a letter from her home church saying that the, the elders of their church had decided to pay for her education in the Bible. She had no more worries. And she was wise enough, even being a high school student, to know the Lord owns that cattle on a thousand hills and he can sell cows anytime he wants. And yet people worry. Most of you know we're building a quite amazing church over here. If you haven't been by, you can pretty much stand on any lawn and I.E. he can see the tower, I think. It's, you know, it's, it's 40 feet tall. But um, I don't think we knew how big that was going to be until <laughs> from the designs until they actually built it. We're building that building at, with no debt. And we only have 100 members in our church. And it's particularly because of the generosity of a few people. There are some people in our church who worry every day that we're doing this. You know? And I'll hear them say in prayers, you know, things like, 
Lord, we need you to send a lot of people because we got this big building we have to pay for and fill. And I'm thinking, oh, dear brother, dear sister, bless your heart. <laughs> God, God can do this. You know, God, God can do any of this if we believe, and we believe it's God's will that we do it. You know, I haven't had anybody say that it's not God's will that we do that. But then people worry about paying for it. And they're taking care of Because we are only stewards. You know, he owns the cattle on a thousand hills, and he, whatever he needs to, we just sell some cows. Okay. That's like my fifth sermon so far. We've only been going an hour. Um, Haggai 2, 8, 9. God says, the silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord Almighty. He owns all wealth, in other words. Revelation 4, 11. You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will all were created and have their being. He made them. He controls them. He still owns them. There's a wonderful story that... Um, Earl Palmer, our old pastor, told. Earl talks a lot about the fact that there are two great pillars of the Christian faith. Creation and redemption. God made us, and then he redeemed us. To redeem means to, to buy back, to pay a price for it. And Earl used the analogy of creation and redemption of the Brooklyn Bridge. There are these two pillars that support this astonishing bridge. Um, and they go down to the through in, through the river to the bedrock of the earth, literally. And they support all the cables that hold this thing up. And Christianity is like that. Everything else hangs on God's creation and his redemption. God made it, and then he paid a price for it in Jesus. Well, Earl tells this wonderful story of a little boy, New York City, who made this sailboat. And he worked very hard for a very long time to make this sailboat. Beautiful little sailboat. And he takes it out on one of the ponds in Central Park, and he puts it in the water, and the wind catches the sail, and it sails off, and it's just beautiful. And then as it gets out about 50 feet, he realizes he had not had a plan for how to get it back. <laughs> and so the sailboat that he worked so hard to build, to make, is gone. Well, a few days later, he's walking down the street, and he walks by a pawn shop, and he looks in the window, and there's his sailboat in the window. And he goes into the guy, and says, that's my sailboat. I made that with my own hands. And the guy said, well, I'm sorry, but I can't give it to you. I paid somebody else for that. If you want it, you'll have to buy it. So he went home, and he broke open his piggy bank, and got all of his money, and he asked his dad for some money, and he got it all together, and he went back in, and he dumped this money on the counter. And it was just enough to buy this sailboat. And as he was walking out of the store holding his sailboat, he said, now you are truly mine, because I made you, and then I paid a price for you. That's what God can claim of us. He made us, and then he paid a price for us. He owns us. And he owns everything in our lives. He made the world, and he paid a price for the world. God, in Jesus Christ, redeemed us, but he redeemed the world as well. The time will come when the lion will lay down with the lamb. When all that is broken in the world will also be healed. Because the world has fallen as well. That's why natural disasters occur. At the sin of Adam and Eve, the whole world fell. And yet all of the world will be redeemed eventually. The process has already started. It will be completed at the return of Jesus. So God made the world, and then he redeemed the world. And yet you still have people looking at the world in terms of my things, my money, my possessions, my abilities, my achievements, my rights... It's all about me, rather than about God. Psalm 100 says, it is God who made us, not we ourselves. And we did not redeem ourselves. Paul says, you were bought with a price. You are no longer yours, or you are not yours. Okay? We need to remember that. The basic spiritual principle of possessing things, that is the acquisition I talked about earlier, does not bring us joy. The only joy we can find is being good stewards of using God's things in a way that brings Him pleasure, and we then feel His pleasure. Okay? Questions about that? And there they sat stunned for some moments. <laughs> well, let's take a break. As I said, I don't expect that I'm going to have 50 more minutes of talk here. I never know when I, when I first start the classes how, how much it's going to take, and I'm committed to not talking, you know, 
don't talk me on the, the clothes. Don't sell me on the clothes. I, when, when I'm done, we'll finish. Um, let's talk a little bit more about, however, stewardship. In addition to the fact that stewardship means recognizing that God owns everything, it also realize, is a matter of realizing that all of all that we have has been entrusted to us. And that word entrusted is very important. It has embedded in it the word trust. God trusts us. God hopefully expects us, if we would use the word hopeful for God, um, there's the paradox of a perfect being, and yet he acts hopeful toward us, you know, that we will make the right choices. He has entrusted things to us. Um, many people, even once they realize the pr earlier principle, that is that God owns everything, even if they know that, they still act as though God didn't own it, and they did. So even after we come to the cognitive recognition that God owns everything, we then have to decide how is that going to impact how we deal with stuff. The recognition that anything we have is what God entrusted to us. The recognition that we don't deserve anything. People who say, well, I, you know, I demand what I deserve. I want to, I'm going to get what I deserve. Trust me, my brothers and sisters, you don't want what you deserve. <laughs> We want instead what is the product of God's grace and His mercy. And yet people think they deserve things. We don't deserve anything other than judgment. We have no rights to demand anything. We don't own anything. And we will, as things have been entrusted to us, we will be held accountable for how we use them. So a number of verses, again, related to things being entrusted to us. 1 Corinthians 29, 14. Everything comes from you. And we have been given, and we have given you only what comes from your hand. This is in Chronicles when it's talking about giving back to God, you know, giving, tithing, tithes, offerings. Everything starts out coming from God anyway. Some people have this idea as though they own everything, and if they give anything back, and I'm not just talking about giving to the church, although again that's an obvious example when you, when you tithe or give an offering to the church, but anything they do that's charitable, anything that that they're giving, some people believe that they're doing God a favor. Again, that God is wringing his hands, hoping somebody will do something so that God's will can be done. God doesn't need our favors. He doesn't, nothing we do is a favor to God. People think giving to God is optional. And again, I'm talking about giving to God not just money, but giving of our abilities, our time, talents, energy, everything else. That, well, you know, if I have extra time, then I'll do something for the church or for charitable causes or for, you know, whatever. It's not our time in the first place. The idea that if we do it, we're doing God a favor and that it's entirely optional is wrong-headed. It is not a, a, a correct Christian understanding of being stewards of all of those resources that God has given us. All of it comes from His hand. Anything we give back is our way of saying thank you. A tithe and offering in the church is a way of saying thank you for all your blessings, God. If we don't give back to the things of God, if giving is a thank you, then what is not giving? It's refusing to say thank you. It's denying that all things come from God's hand. From Luke 12, for all these things the nations of the world eagerly seek, but your Father knows that you need them. By the way, this were, this is previously Jesus is saying, talking about food and drink and clothing. All these things the nations of the world eagerly seek, but your Father knows that you need these things. But seek His kingdom, and these things will be added to you. God will give you those things if your priorities are straight. 1 Corinthians 4.7 what do you have that you did not receive, as in from God? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as though you did not? This is my money. I worked hard for it my whole life. Really? Didn't God give it to you? And or didn't God give you whatever it was that it took for you to earn it? That's, what, that's exactly what that's talking about. You boast as though God didn't send, give this to you, and yet you received it from Him. 1 Corinthians 4. Let a man regard us in this manner as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. In this case, moreover, it is required of stewards that one be found trustworthy. We are called on to be trustworthy stewards of all that God has entrusted to us. This particular case, it's talking about 
stewards, good stewards of, trustworthy stewards of the ministry, the gifts. The Holy Spirit gives gifts to everyone who is a Christian. Everyone has gifts for the good of the body, Paul writes in Corinthians. Are we good stewards of that? Meaning, are we using those gifts for the benefit of others? Likewise, we are called upon to be trusty, trustworthy stewards of all the other resources that God has entrusted to us. 1 Peter 4.10 Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. We are stewards. We have a stewardship responsibility to use the gifts God has given. And everything is a gift. Life itself is a gift. And Colossians 1.25 of, uh, of this church I was made a minister, Paul writes, according to the stewardship from God bestowed on me for your benefit, so that I might fully carry out the preaching of the Word of God. Paul is recognizing, and he does in a number of places, that he has a stewardship responsibility to do what God has both called him and equipped him to do. Are we aware of all that God has given us that we are to be good stewards of? And you know, it, it's important that we're good stewards of the little things too. Luke 16, 10 says, He who is faithful in a very little thing is faithful also in much. And he who is unrighteous in a very little thing is unrighteous also in much. Living and working in Mexico, having a church in Mexico, there are many, many times when the alternative is presented to us of, well, if you'll simply pay an extra 5,000 pesos here, then you won't have to pay that 100,000 pesos there. We won't do that. We will not do that. Three times I've been stopped, and it was very clear the policeman, while I won't come right out and say it, was expecting that if I would just give him 500 pesos, 1,000 pesos, I could be on my way. I won't do it. Because that is not being righteous in the little things. And people say, well, big deal. 500 pesos, you're on your way. No, not going to do that. Because you start breaking down, you start being unfaithful, unrighteous in little things. Where does that stop? Where does the line get drawn? I've had some, actually a couple of very funny, I, one of the hottest days last May, I'm coming this direction, going that direction, just the other side of Walmart, you know, by Turbo Landing. Policeman calls me over. He says, you ran that stop signal. I said, actually, all due respect, I didn't. I said, yeah, you did. He said, I need to see your documents. Well, I was driving a Honda Fit that we had that was in Carolyn's name. We have a different, a different last name. Well, I didn't have anything to prove that it was me. She was in the States. I couldn't call her. Um, and so he said, oh, well, I'm going to have to impound your car. And I said, oh, I wish you wouldn't do that. You know, it's my wife. Da, da, da. He said, no, I'm going to have to impound your car. And he goes back to his car and comes back a few minutes later. And he says, okay, I've already called a record. But, you know, you could just pay me, and I'll take care of the record and everything, and you can be on your way, you know. And we, we were talking. And I'm sitting there. My car door's open. I'm sitting there, and I'm in sort of in the shade. He's standing in the sun. He's taking off his hat, and he's wiping his brow. Boy, it's hot. Man, it's hot. You know, I said, I, and I and I said, and I honestly meant this. I said, you know, and he, would, he kept saying things like, well, you know, I've let you go, but I've already called the record. You know, they're going to be here in a few minutes, and so we have to pay them. And he said, but you know, you could go on and, and you give me the money and I'll pay them. And I went, no, that's okay, I'll wait. And I said to him, I said, you know, you don't have to stand here in the sun. You can go. I'll wait for the record. I'll, I'll you know, he's going to throw my car in or you want me to just pay them here? I'll do that. <laughs> and finally, he, and, and he had said, oh, you know, you, you know what do you do? I, I said, I'm, soy el pastor de Iglesia Presbyteriana del Lago. Some part of this was the Spanish part of his English. And, um, so you're a pastor, huh? You know, yes. And after about 25 minutes, he finally said, well, I don't know where the record is. You're not getting here. Why don't you just go on? <laughs> Thank you. I really appreciate that. Now, I have had so many friends who say, man, just pay him. Just pay him. Well, I feel like that's being unfaithful. That's being dishonest in a small thing. The world is not going to come to an end, but I'm not okay with doing that. Um, and so we as a church, 
the many, many, many times, we actually had a guy who was counseling us on how to do the finances. And he would say, we, our dear treasurer, Dean Hansen, at one point threatened to resign because this guy, he was in a meeting with this guy, and this guy said, well, you need to just fake these receipts. Just take receipts and fill them out, you know, in order to be able to tell the government what they want to hear. Now, we weren't, we weren't actually stealing any money or anything, but we did, it's hard to get receipts for everything down here. And so, and Dean said, I, he said he was going to resign. He said, because I'm not going to do that. And I said, no, you're not going to resign because we're not going to do that. We won't do that. Are we faithful in little things as well as good things? That's a stewardship issue to me. Are we being good stewards of, of the image people have of us, of our money, of our character? You know, I have a responsibility to be a good steward of my character. That as much as possible, I'm not, it's far from perfect. None of us is going to be perfect. But are we really making the effort to try to trying to stay in that? Okay. Uh, questions about any of that? And you know what? If they had hauled my car in, and I'd had to come back next week when Carolyn was here and bail it out, then that's what we would have done. So, how should we then live? I've stolen that title from a, from a uh, Francis Schaeffer book. Kind of summing up a lot of the things we've said so far. Um, first, everything is created by God. Secondly, in addition to God creating everything, God has also paid a great price in Jesus to redeem the world from sin. It's our sin. But again, when, when we, when our ancient ancestors, when Adam and Eve sinned, the whole world fell. What's the first gift that God gave to Adam and Eve after, after the fall? Clothing? Yeah, but made out of what? Yeah. Animal skins. What does that mean? Death entered into the world right then. The sin of Adam and Eve was a created a fallen nature as well. All right? <clears throat> so the redemption of Jesus Christ eventually will be a redemption of all creation, not just of humanity. And God has paid a huge price for that. So, as I told you the story about the boy with the boat, God made it. And God has paid a price to redeem it, to buy it back because of our sin. And therefore, for both of those reasons, everything therefore belongs to God. It's only when we truly believe that that our lives change. And if we truly do believe that, then everything changes. The, our fearfulness over whether or not the stock market is going to crash, it's God's stock, stock market. And the investment I have in it is His. You know, all of a sudden, all of the burden comes off. I often have thought that, like when I'm working with clients, doing consulting work, if I were, if it were all on me, and if I were responsible for success in everything, I can't imagine how much pressure that would be. I wouldn't want to take that. Mother Teresa said, we are not called to succeed, we are called to obey. The success is up to God. That's one of the principles of stewardship. God owns it all. God ultimately is responsible for it all. He wants us to be responsible stewards. But the steward is not the one who ultimately is responsible for the property, responsible to take care of it, but it belongs to somebody else. And that's a fundamental principle. And once we really get that, it changes everything in terms of how we react to the world, how we respond to events in the world. Um, and the fact is, I mean, I said earlier, you know, we're responsible in, I quoted Luke 16.10, that if we are faithful in small things, we'll be faithful in large things. If we're unfaithful in small things, we'll be unfaithful in large things. People seem to think, well, if God gave me more, then I would be charitable. I would, you know, I would, you know, I don't, I can't afford to give anything now, but I'd give a lot of money if I, you know what? If you give nothing now, I don't care if God made you as wealthy as Carlos Slim, you would give none then, too. The fact is that it's not the quantity, it's how we see it, what our sense of responsibility as stewards are of it. So it's not, and the whole principle of the widow's mind, the widow gave everything she had and was blessed for that, even though it was nothing compared to what somebody else could have given casually. C.S. Lewis, um, when asked one time, how much should a Christian give to the church, to the things of God? 
And Lewis said, well, I don't know exactly how much an individual person should give, except it should be more than you can spare. More than you can spare. If you don't feel any pinch in how you are giving to the things of God, and I don't just mean money, I mean time, I mean energy, I mean resources and talents. If you don't feel any pinch from that, if you don't feel that it's more than is comfortable, then it's not enough. More than you can spare. I fundamentally believe that's true. And anything we have or will ever have is given to us not for our use. It's given to us, I'm sorry, for our use and our stewardship, but nothing ever really belongs to us. It's only when we truly believe that, it's only when we live that out, that we have a right relationship with all of the created world, and only then will we find satisfaction with it. Otherwise, we're going to be threatened constantly that something's going to go wrong. But only when we recognize, it's, this isn't my stuff anyway, this is God's stuff. He ultimately is responsible for it. Then, you're, you're free. And in some ways, that's... That it's then that you're free for God to bless you with these things. No matter how much you have, if you're fearful over it, you're never going to be okay. You're never going to have enough. Therefore, and I've said this before many times actually, if we are good stewards, the question we must ask of everything, everything in our lives, not just our money, our time, our talents, our energy, our abilities, our relationships. The question we need to ask is, what does God want us to do with His stuff? Because it's His stuff. You want victory in your life? You want fulfillment in your life? Then answer that question. What does God want you to do with His stuff that He has entrusted to you as a steward? Comments about that, questions about that. What do you think? Does this make sense to you? Have you thought about it this way before? You're getting some yeses and some noes and some <laughs> bobbleheads. <laughs> okay. How do you see this applying to your lives? Somebody tell me. Uh, I see it as applying to my life as problems that uh, have, uh, recent problems uh, that I, I felt that um, were uh, a little uh, uh, beyond my capability, um, I kind of let it go. I mean, uh, I feel that, that uh, these problems have been presented as a possible same thing as a gift of the stewardship mm -hmm. for me to handle. Right. And to handle it in a Christ-like manner, instead of uh, my whining and crying and why me and, um, you know, I, I reach this age, how come I'm having problems, I'm supposed to be free of that stuff and yeah. all, that and all that other stuff. Um, that's kind of like the worldly bitching, whereas, whoa, wait a second, you know, this is a whole different slant. Instead of looking at it as, um, why me, poor little me. Uh, looking at it like, um, okay, why not take a problem and look at it as a gift instead of a problem? Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know that there is always a solution for it, but because of that, it can be a change of attitude, right. which will enrich my life, making me feel a whole lot better, and stop the worry pattern that I have. Good. Yeah, and I think that the issue of what does God want us to do with His stuff Sometimes the question is, what does God want me to do in this situation? Now, it's a little more complicated than just wearing a bracelet that says WWJD. What would Jesus do? Now, that's a good question to ask. But Dallas Willard, actually, in one of his books, he said, people who don't do anything to grow closer to Jesus, to grow more Christ-like, who come to a situation in their life and then try to say, well, you know, what would Jesus do in this situation, are going to be handicapped. He said, in the same way that someone who wants to run a four-minute mile but never practices, or somebody who wants to play the, you know, the Bach, 
you know, piano concerto in D minor, but has never practiced, but he wants to go to Carnegie Hall and play it for a large audience. The fundamental principle is that in order to be able to perform at a certain level, you have to discipline your life. You have to be involved. You have to prepare yourself. You have to practice. You have to, well, when we talked earlier about the spiritual disciplines, and we have a whole other class that we've done on that, the spiritual disciplines, which involve the study of the Word and prayer and, and others, are one of the ways that we prepare ourselves spiritually so that when we come to a difficult situation and we say, well, what does God want me to do in this situation? You're much more prepared, you're much more likely to be able to both identify and then implement the right answer to that than if you just come to it cold. And that's why this isn't, you know, this isn't a one-off kind of thing. We have to change our mindset on some stuff. We have to prepare to experience the disciplines. I had somebody recently say, well, you know what, I, I have trouble knowing what God wants me to do. And, and I don't even have it here right now. I, uh, but I, I held up a Bible and said, well, did you look in here? There's a reason God gave us that book. It's because if we study it, if we you know, get into it, if we immerse ourselves in it, the more we learn it, the more we will know what God wants us to do. Okay, Very simply. But in addition to that, there is the presence of the Holy Spirit in us in prayer. And I... I I said in Bible study last week, I think. Something that I, if I'm paying attention, and that's the greatest failing of humanity is not paying attention. Right, Carolyn? That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, the, the greatest failing, because if we're paying attention, Scripture said we would see the glory of God in, in the created world. Even. But when I'm paying attention, often if I ask, if I pray in, in a, a, a question of God, the very next thing that I hear in my head I believe is God's answer if I'm paying attention. I will, you know, somebody will do something very, I don't know if you know this, but people can be very frustrated. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And trust me, this is more true for pastors than anybody. Right? <laughs> and I'll have an experience with somebody in the church and it will be so frustrating and I'll say to myself, Lord, what am I going to do with this person? This is a real, this really happened not too long ago. What am I going to do with this person? And the next thing I heard was, well, you could try loving them. Ouch. <laughs> Often, if I'm paying attention, I will hear God's answer right immediately, the next day. And I don't think it's just my brain, you know, the, the left side of my brain telling the right side of my brain what it is I should do. I really think that it is God, the Holy Spirit speaking, if I'm paying attention. But it's also true that there, there, is, there is the truth of Scripture. I mean, that's an affirmation of things that I find in the Word as well. But first, we have to have the right attitude. It's not all up to me. It doesn't all belong to me. It is God's stuff. It is God's world. He is the one who's responsible ultimately for success. The only, only thing I have to answer is, am I doing the best I can to be a trustworthy steward? of what he has given me. And if I can answer that yes with an honest heart, then I'm doing very well. Doesn't mean I'm gonna always win, but it means I'm not gonna be broken by defeat, because ultimately that's his. And what you can accomplish if you're willing to do that is extraordinary. Other questions or comments? How do you all feel about that? Chris? Well, I I believe this, and I really do try to live it, but I do worry, and I think the worry more than about like, oh, well, am I going to have money, this or that, is, well, am I doing the right things with what God's given me? You know, the, am I using the money, or, you know, like you said about investing in the stock market, or doing, like, in other words, yeah. you're, you're the steward of it, and you're supposed to do something with it. Yeah. And I'm assuming, well, I believe, you're not supposed to just give everything away so you have nothing. This, that's what God specifically shows you to do. So it's a matter of just being faithful with what God has given us. Yeah. And to me, that the worry is the worry. The thing that kind of weighs on me as well. Yeah. Am I doing the right things? With it? Right. You know, I'm making the right decision. And that's you know, sometimes I think, well, I worry about money, and I'm like, well, no, actually, I don't really. But what I really do worry about or concern myself with is that. Am I doing the right thing? Right. Well, you're right that 
Being a good steward involves risk. The, the parable of the talents in the Bible that Jesus tells, they're the three, you know, the three stewards. And one of them invests and gets, you know, tenfold, one of them invests and gets fivefold. The other one, when the master comes back, he says, Well, master, I know that you are a tough master and that you reap what you do not sow, etc. And so being fearful of you, I just took the talent you gave me and I buried them. So here they are back again. No risk. And the response from the master is, oh, evil steward, you know, take from him and give it to the one who acquired ten. So not taking, not being willing to take any risk with what you have is seen as a bad thing. You know, you have to be willing to take some risk. Part of that is faith. Now, for me, in, in situations like that, and you know, it's easy for me to stand up here and say this. The practical practicality of this is sometimes I'm good at this and sometimes I'm not. Um, I have found that there is great release in being able, when you're confronted with how do I invest this, how do I do this, of being able to say, Lord, I am a poor down sheep. That's what it boils down to. I'm going to do the best I can with this, but beyond the best I can, I'm counting on you to guide my hand. But you have to do something. Henrietta Mears, famous Sunday school teacher from Hollywood Press, and she sort of renovated the whole Sunday school movement in America. She used to say, you can't steer a parked car. People will sit there and say, God, tell me what to do. 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 And they won't do anything. And I think God is saying, as soon as you get off your butt and start moving in one direction, I'll tell you whether or not that's the right direction. You can't steer a parked car. There's the story of the guy who was praying, God, you know, let me win the Irish sweepstakes. If you'll let me win the Irish sweepstakes, here's all the good I will do with that money. And he kept praying and praying, Lord, I'll do all this good with this money. And Lord, please. And he prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed. And, and he finally got frustrated and said, Lord, I've been praying for years for this, and you still don't let me win this lottery. And the Lord spoke to him in a quiet voice and said, well, you could at least buy a ticket. <laughs> I think that, and I'm not saying winning the lottery is the way to be obedient to God, but if we are willing to say, Lord, I don't know for sure. I'm going to do the very best I can. I'm, I'm trusting you to direct me. If I'm doing the wrong thing, steer me in the right direction. If I'm doing the right thing, affirm me in that so that I'll do it more. And I think that at that point, Confessing our own limits and inabilities and trusting God for direction. It's not like God dumps all this stuff on us and then God leaves. He doesn't go to Puerto Vallarta and say, well, I'll come back later and find out how it's going. God, the Holy Spirit is always available to us. And part of it is we have to have faith that he, he wants the best for us, that God wants us to succeed. And so, ask Him. Show me. Again, my prayer is I'm a poor dumb sheep. I think this is what you want me to do. This is the direction I'm going. Please, God, if that's not it, then show me something else. Okay? And then don't freak out if you make a wrong turn. All right? There may be there may be God's will in that too. Anything else? Questions or comments about this sort of basic theme of the stewardship and Okay, let me close in prayer.